Praise the Lord. You can go have your seats. If you turn your Bible with me to the book of Matthew, uh, we're going to be reading out of chapter 21, and we're going to be reading a lot of verses, verses 1 through 11, but I'm a fast reader, though. But before we get into the words, I want to welcome everybody that's online. Thank you for tuning in. Like and subscribe. Uh, I want to say... We, when, the, when they showed the, the video for the Veti class, it's, we call it Veti now, but, it, but it's really called Bible College. And so when I hear them say, and it's only 195, I could hear somebody saying, what? But um, these are actual college credits. Now, if you try to go to college and take a class, it's going to cost you like 1300 bucks, Right? And so I, 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 I pray you don't miss out on this. And this is, this is if you want to learn. It's not so much if you want to be a pastor, but for sure, if you want to be a licensed minister in Victory Outreach, you need to take these classes. I can't, my, I'm not that good, guys. If I try to make you a licensed minister, they won't let me. You have to have all these credits that are given from this college. Also, I want to mention the drama video. It's been brought to my attention that some people have seen the video and they thought, what is going on here in this church? Why are they smoking crack? Right, but if you it's a, it's it's a commercial. What we're trying to do is trying to get people's attention all over Reno, the Sparks area, the Truckee Meadows, Carson City, all over Ely, that's Florida, all over the place, uh, and uh, we're just trying to show them to get them to come. So we want to show them what that lifestyle leads to, and so that that's why we do the drop the video like that because we're trying to get people to get here that are not saved so that we can get them saved. How many want to see people get saved? So that's going to be. That's going to be, we're going to show it Friday night, this Friday night, and then Easter Sunday, we have one service at 10 o'clock, and we're going to show the drama then, amen? So if you've been praying for somebody, and they're not saved, and you want them to get saved, make sure you bring them, amen? Praise the Lord. You guys have, you guys have Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11? As they approached Jerusalem, he came to Bethage. that's how you pronounce it, Bethage. on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and straightway he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, See your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went, <clears throat> excuse me, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds then went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, <clears throat> the whole city was stirred, and they asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from the Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you uh, this morning. God, I pray that you would use my life for your honor and your glory. I pray that, that what took place on this day, God, over 2,000 years ago, the beginning of the Passion Week, God, uh, it's referred to as that, Lord, we know that it was that, your obedience that you rode into that city, God, so that they could kill you for us, so that you would give your life for us. You knowingly rode into that city. Not only that, but you made a spectacle of it. You came on a donkey because you wanted everybody to see you. I pray, God, that you would use my life for your honor and your glory uh, to bring forth your word with clarity in Jesus' name, let every heart be open. Don't let one word fall to the ground. And everybody said, amen. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the Bible says that the whole place was stirred. That word stirred is where we get the word seismic. You know what seismic is? You know they have a seismic reader where they, where they read the earthquake, right? But when Jesus went into that city, there was an earthquake. He caused so much... He, there was so much arousal. There was so much awakening of the people. They were like, what is going on here? And then they turned around, 
and they see this guy riding on a little donkey. Does that ever get your attention? Because it gets mine. When I think of that, I'm like, man. So when Jesus entered to Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. This, this morning's title of a mess, our message is entitled this morning, Lessons from Palm Sunday. What can we learn from that? Because when we read it, uh, <clears throat> when you're a pastor or you're a teacher or you're, 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 you know, you want to preach a message and you look on Palm Sunday, I'm, I was looking at it, I was thinking, what is here? What is it? You know, he rode in on a donkey. Uh, people praised him. And I thought maybe I could talk about worship, you know, because that's what happened. They were saying Hosanna uh, to the, in the highest, you know. Uh, and then, but then he's riding in on a donkey. And that's how I think of it. Well, he's riding in on a donkey. What's going on here? And God gave me a word for you. Are you guys ready? So the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are the two main hinges upon which the door of salvation turns. If you know anything about doors, you know about the hinges that the, holds the door up, right? Well, the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, um, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are the two main hinges upon which the door of salvation turns. He came into the world on purpose to give his life a ransom. Palm Sunday is sometimes referred to as the beginning of the Passion Week. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 18 through 19, it says, Behold, we're going to go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. And behold, we go to Jerusalem, and there the Son of Man must be betrayed. That's, when you read that, it's amazing to know that Jesus went there knowing that they would kill him. He knew why he was going there. He was going there to die. The time had come. There were many times when he would do miracles and, and bring healing and, 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 and deliver people from demon possession. And people wanted to, 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 to raise him up and, and broadcast his name all over the place. And he would always tell them, now is not the time. It's not the time yet. I don't need this attention. I don't want this attention. It's not time. However, here, it's time. Are you guys still with me? For this week, the city of Jerusalem was crowded with probably, most people believe, over 2 million people. And they were there to commemorate the Passover. You guys know about the Passover, right? Remember when, when the Hebrews got re, uh, delivered from slavery? They, they, they were taken out of slavery, and, and then, you know, God uh, uh, punished Pharaoh and, and, and brought uh all kinds of plagues of, of lice and frogs and turned the, the, the river into blood and, and killed all the firstborn and let hail come out. You guys remember the story? Then he parted the Red Sea, right? But before there was a parting of the Red Sea, there was a slain of a lamb. Remember when he sent the angel of death and then he told them, you guys are my people. What I want you to do is I want you to stay home. I want you to read a little bit, get close to me. But, but before you go into your rooms, into your houses, I want you to get a little lamb, a pure, unblemished lamb. I want you to slaughter it, and I want you to get the blood, and I want you to put it on your doorpost. Because when the angel of death comes, and if he sees that blood, somebody say the blood. When he sees the blood, it's going to pass over your house. And so... To commemorate this, they, they celebrate the Passover. <clears throat> this is something that happened at that time 1,500 years earlier. It was when the Hebrews were set free from slavery. Now, this time, it's Jesus who's going to be the Passover lamb. And it's his blood that's going to save us from eternal death. Jesus heads into Jerusalem where he's going to orchestrate a massive public demonstration because now it is time before he didn't want nobody's attention but now he wants everybody's attention but that really wasn't his style normally jesus moved quietly and he pref he preferred obscurity 
Many times he would tell people that got delivered from demons or healed or got their sight, he would say, don't tell nobody because now's not the time. However, now he wants a huge crowd because what he's about to do, everybody needed to see. Again, going back to the entry, the Bible says in Matthew 21, verses 6 through 9, and the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the donkey and the colt. It's a donkey and a colt. It's the mama and the baby. And he put them, and he put them, their clothes, they put their clothes on them, and they set them there on. They put Jesus on there. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. I don't know if you guys noticed, but we have some palm leaves right here. I put them for you guys. Because I, I want you to see the significance of Palm Sunday. A lot of times we don't really understand the real significance of it. And I want you guys to get it this morning. Or God wants you to get it this morning. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, when you study scripture, that word Hosanna means save us now. So what's happening is they're, maybe they're starting to believe, some of them, that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is coming to save. And so, But they have this idea that when he comes, he's going to take over and conquer. He's going to come with an army, but instead, he comes on a donkey. And there is no army behind him, and there are no warriors behind him, and there are no shields and swords and Guys marching, and you hear all, you see all the dust coming. It's not like that. It's a man riding in on a donkey. But they say Hosanna, which means saves now. It means save us now. The crowd wanted Jesus to overthrow the Roman Empire. That's what they were hoping for because they wanted, actually, they wanted their freedom. But they didn't realize they were going to get their freedom through the death of Jesus Christ. Save us now. But as the time went on, when you studied the Bible, the crowd realized that none of that was Jesus' intent. He didn't come to make war. He came to make peace. And he came to save people. When they see that, when you study the Bible, it says you can could, you could see that where the people begin to turn against him. Because they wanted one thing from God and they weren't going to get it. That happens today. You guys are so quiet. That happens today. There are many today who, because they don't get what they want from God, they leave. They leave them. I mean, we could read the scripture and we think to, my, we could think to ourselves, those terrible people, how could they be like that? But a lot of us are like that, including myself. We get like that. We see the same thing happen today. There's a tendency within the heart of man to back out of our commitments when things don't work out the way we want them to. In John chapter 6, verse 67, uh, verse 66 to 67 says, From this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. He says, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. He asked him, you guys don't want to leave too? What happened? He was out there. He said, if you want to be my followers, you got you to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And you can pick up your cross and follow me. And the Bible says that many people left him. He turned around to his disciples and said, are you guys going to leave too? Is it too hard for you too? Am I asking too much for you too? We're going somewhere, guys. But there is a tendency in the heart of man to back out of their commitments when things don't go the way they want them to. Jesus Christ came to die and pay the price for our sins. I, I wrote right here before I got to this part that people, we're so fickle. One day we're, we're, we're excited, we want to take the rope of Jesus, the next day we want to quit. Like that. One day we love our wives, the next day we don't like them. One day we love our husbands, the next day we don't like them. So fickle. Jesus Christ came to die and pay the price for our sins. How many believe that? Because of that, if he never does anything else for us, what he's already done is more than enough to gain our loyalty, affection, gratitude, and our devotion until he comes. 
I owe him my life for because of what he did for me on Calvary. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to hell. I don't care what anybody says. What my mother-in-law says, anybody. I'm going to heaven. How many believe that? When he rode into that city, he rode in for me. He rode in for my redemption, knowing he would be tortured and rejected by men. He knew that all his disciples who were there with him every single day for three years, he knew that they were going to abandon him. After all he invested in them and and everything he did for them, he knew that they were going to leave him. Except for one, John the Beloved. Oh, and then the women, they didn't leave. What lessons can we learn uh, from this scripture? Jesus, because, because, and the, the reason why we have to look for a lesson is because Jesus didn't just come to die, but he came to disciple, in case you guys didn't know that. There's a portion of scripture, I think it's John 17, where he's praying for uh, his, his, his disciples, and he mentions them over 17 times in that prayer. Because the next greatest thing that Jesus did when he came to the earth besides die was leave us a message. And he expects us to be disciples and preach it. I don't know if I said that the way I wanted to say it, but. So what lessons can we learn from the scripture? Jesus came to die, but he also came to leave an example of how his disciples and every Christian should live. When you read this portion of scripture, you should see the obedience of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the book of Philippians that he was obedient unto death. So one lesson that we should learn from this portion of Scripture is that we need to be obedient unto death. Pretty clear, huh? We need to, even if it hurts us, even if it costs us, God wants us to be obedient. We need to be obedient unto death. We need to, we, we, um, when he rode in, he knew he was riding into his own death. He was willing to die to self. I, now, when I, when I was reading this and going over this yesterday, I, I, I would have said, I would have, this is probably, be, I don't know if any of you guys would have thought like me, but I would have been like, so you want me, you want me to die and ride in on a donkey? Like, why can't I be like Gladiator or Braveheart? You know, like, why can't I go out like that? Freedom! You know, why do I got to come in on the donkey? Jesus didn't die for Jesus. That's what God told me when I was asking the question. He said, because Jesus didn't die for Jesus, he died for you. Maybe if he died for him, he would have come in on a stallion, a nice white stallion, big, strong one. But he died for us. It wasn't about him. It was about us. He died for us. Are you guys still with me? He died for us. In this Palm Sunday sermon, we're going to learn, I want to learn, I want to show you three things that I really, really believe we need to learn. Number one, you guys ready? Anybody taking notes? Number one, we must serve with humility. Here's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He had legions of angels that he could have called down to destroy everybody in that city, all two million of them, including every soldier, but he didn't. He was humble. He served with humility. I think that messes up a lot of us. Because we serve, but when somebody says the wrong thing to us, come at us a different way, sideways, backwards, all of a sudden we're like, you know, forget you then. But we must serve with humility. It must have been hard, listen, It must have been hard to have been a disciple of Jesus. It was glorious for sure, but it was hard. Jesus, no doubt, demanded things of his disciples. Go, you know what I want you to do? Go over there, catch a fish, and bring the coin out of his mouth. For real? For real, Jesus? Are you playing with me? You serious? Yeah, just go do what I tell you to do. Humble yourself, go catch a fish, And when you open up that fish's mouth, you're going to find a coin in there. You guys remember the story? 
Or how about the fisherman when you told him, throw your net on the other side? These guys have been fishers for their whole life, and now he's coming against their knowledge of fishing. Like, do you ever get mad? Nobody here. But if you're a mechanic or something like that, and somebody tells you, oh, you got to just touch that right there, you're like, you want me to do it or not? You want to do it? You can do it. You want to do it? Right? So when Jesus says, hey, throw your net on the other side, it was a ridiculous demand. In their eyes, it was ridiculous. It made no sense. But when they obeyed, what happened? They got this big old catch of fish. Now, how about this way? How about this one? Walk on water. I want you to walk on water. What if, if I told you that, hey, let's go to uh, Lake Tahoe, and I want you to walk on water. Just walk on here. You'll be like, no, pastor, something's wrong. These 12 had an inside relationship with Jesus. He was their mentor, their spiritual advisor, their king, their lord, and their rabbi. Some of the moments were glorious, and we could even say they were prestigious. The Gospels say he even gave them the power to preach and heal the sick in his name. I'm going somewhere, guys. Stay with me. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. We know that these disciples were sent out with the 70. They were part of that group. And so all these guys knew what it was like to cast out a demon. They had healed the sick cleanse the lepers, and preach the gospel of the kingdom. But it's hard. Somebody say it's hard. It's hard to go from a main actor on stage to a stagehand behind the curtain. When Jesus told his disciples, go ahead of me, and over there, you're going to find a donkey. Donkey duty. Now, what I want you to go do, you heal, you heal the sick, you, 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 you've seen blind eyes open. Now I want you to go look for a donkey. Donkey duty. I would venture to say nobody likes donkey duty, especially after you've been used by God to bring healing to people and do great things where, where you, you received accolades and, and people are saying, wow, man, that was a powerful message. How many times have they walked up and said, man, that floor sure looks clean the way you mopped it. Stay with me. They went from being evangelists to donkey duty. One of the lessons that we learned from this is if you want to be a servant of the Lord, you must be humble. I, would, I, I think I, the Bible doesn't really say how tall Jesus was, but I, I imagine he was either my height or taller. But the Bible says he rode in on a baby donkey. I was tempted to have Mo and Byron drive in on a tricycle, a little three-wheel training thing. So you can see, so you can see how it must have looked. So you can see how it must have looked when Jesus came in on a donkey. I mean, he's maybe six feet tall. The donkey's like this. His feet might have may have been dragging. Right? May have been dragging. That's humbleness. But it was all part of scripture. It was all part of prophecy because the Bible says in Zechariah 9.9 that your Messiah, that your king is going to ride in on a baby donkey. See, we like the good part. I made you more than a conqueror. No weapon formed against you will prosper. But can you ride in on a donkey? Donkey duty. Humility is demanding. Instead of working miracles and healing the sick, we find these two disciples on donkey duty. Who wants to volunteer for donkey duty? You can sense, you can sense when you read this, you can sense the disciples even seem confused about how to retrieve a donkey. So Jesus has to tell them how. He says, go and find it. Bring it back to me. And when I was reading that, I was very quickly reminded of King Saul. You know, when King Saul was called and anointed, you know what he was doing? He was looking for a donkey. He was looking for a donkey. And that's why when, when the prophet tells him, when he takes away the kingdom from him, when God takes away the kingdom from him, 
He uses these words. He says, when you are humble in your own sight, you used to be humble. You used to would have done anything. There was nothing that, that was too low for you. To sweep a floor, to do anything was an honor and a privilege for you. Now it's beneath you. That's what happened to King Saul, guys. Somebody turn around and tell somebody, donkey duty. Lessons in humility are tough. They could be mistaken. This morning I was talking to uh, one of the women that came from uh, the, the conference. Um, and I had told the guys in the green room, I don't know about that. I'm going to say it. I told the guys in the green room, let's see who the real warrior is. <laughs> I might get in trouble because my wife's not here. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, let's see who the real warrior is. And who comes in? Ilana. Right? And and uh she got home at four, got up, did the green room, working on kinds of stuff in the office. Anyways, that's not what I was trying to do. But she made a statement because I asked her, I said, Ilana, what did God tell you over there? And she said, you know what? I've been asking God. Why are you keeping me away from certain things? Why, why don't you let me enjoy them? And she said something to this effect. She said, I'm not keeping you away from it. I'm keeping you away from trouble. I'm keeping you away from problems. I don't want you to, I don't want you to be ruined by some things. And, it, and she don't know it, but she really ministered to me when she said that because I, I think I should be doing things that I'm not doing and and. and, and, and that very moment, God said, I'm keeping you from the problem. And I was like, whoa. I make you say amen to that. Because sometimes we think, ah, I'm not in it because I'm not good enough. No, you're not in it because you're good enough. And if we put you in there, you're going to get all spoiled and, and twisted up in your mind. and Right? Jesus makes sure lessons in humility are tough. And Jesus makes sure our souls are not always center stage. He knows it's not good for the soul to be continually, to be continual, continually popular. God isn't looking for celebrities. He's looking for servants. Jesus, listen, Jesus would later that week show them that he also was willing to take on the role of donkey duty or the role of a servant. In John chapter 13, verses 3 through 5, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand. Every time I read that, I'm amazed. My mind is blowing. My mind is blown because he says, Jesus knowing that everything had been given to him in his hands. In other words, he had all the power. It was a done deal. He had all the power at his disposal right there in his hands. He was the King of kings, the Lord of lords, 100%. And what does he do? He washes feet. Went from donkey duty to feet duty. Stinky feet duty. The Bible says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. He, here, there's, he, and, and he knows exactly who he is. He knows exactly the power he possesses. He knows where he's going. And yet the Bible says he disrobes himself and begins to wash feet. After that, he poured water into a basin, verse 5, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Jesus did something even more humbling than donkey duty. He did stinky feet duty. He feet, as a matter of fact, he cleaned feet that stepped into donkey droppings. This thing that Jesus did was the lowest job of any servant. To wash someone's feet in that day, you had to be the lowest ranked servant in the house. In John 13, 13 through 15, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and, and you say, well, for I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. The kingdom is different from the world. This kingdom, 
God's kingdom is different from the world. The world measures success from one station in life or one uh, place in life. In the kingdom of God, we are seen and recognized by how we serve. I know this to be true. I know this to be true. And let me tell you how I know this to be true. When I go to the conference, there's always a lot of people that say, hey, pastor, what's going on? Good to see you. And in my back of my mind, I'm thinking, who are you? Like, who are you? I know who they are, and they know who I am because of my service. Not because of me. But they've seen me serve continually and continually and continually and continually. The kingdom of God is measured by our service. Our status in the kingdom of God is measured by our service. Are you guys catching that? Are you catching the fact that God wants you to serve? God wants us to serve. Who we are in God's kingdom is measured by how we serve. The kingdom is different from the world. The world measures success from one station in life. In the kingdom of God, we are seen and recognized by how we serve. It's not just about how loud we shout at the altar. The question is, as a disciple of Jesus, do you serve well? Are you faithful in your service? Or do you call in because you got a headache? I understand some headaches are worse than others. I get it. But are we always being unfaithful? Because you're going to be measured by your service. I'm going to be measured by my service. Do you serve well? Because if you serve well, ultimately you will be given recognition. I hope, I hope that you're looking forward to the day when you're going to hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He doesn't say, well done, thou good and faithful husband. He doesn't say, well, good, well done, thou good and faithful wife. He doesn't even say, well done, thou good and faithful pastor. He says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But you can't serve if you're not humble. It's hard to serve when you're not humble. I remember one time we were at a banquet, and we were around. Well, actually, we were having a meeting. I remember exactly where it was at. It was in Eagle Rock. And it was all, they called all the pastors together, and I had this one friend with me. And uh, right before that, he was, like, doing all kinds of stuff, right? And we were doing all kinds of stuff. And I asked him, I Something told me, ask him to get you a, 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 a bottle of water. Now, I thought he was going to struggle with it because all the big pastors were there, all the elders, the regionals, and all that. Like, and so I thought he was going to struggle with it. And guess what? He struggled with it. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't do it at all. But the reason why he didn't do it, because he didn't want to look like he was serving me. Can I tell you something? It's challenging to be a, a servant. To be a servant means you serve anybody and everybody at any given time. That's a real servant's heart. Not just because it's the pastor or a leader or because you can get something from it. No, a real servant serves anybody at any time. Regardless, and you, it doesn't matter who's looking. It doesn't matter who's looking. Some of the greatest people in heaven, nobody knows. going to be some grandma that was praying at three in the morning for a lot of people. <laughs> so it's not just about how loud we shout at the altar. The question is, as a disciple of Jesus, do you serve well? Jesus is the greatest servant of all time. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, who being in the form of God did not consider a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you want to be great in the kingdom, you must become a servant. The Bible says 
Jesus said he was greatest of all, must be the most servant of all. Jesus said that, guys. You want to be the greatest of all? You have to be the most servant of all. The lesson that we learn on that day from this portion of Scripture is that if you want to serve the Lord and you want to complete your service as a servant to the Lord, you want to be a good disciple, you want to be pleasing to the God, you must humble yourself and serve. And be willing, listen, and be willing to look like a fool. Because I love the Lord. I love God, I, 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 I'm, but I'm fickle, right? I love God, but I honestly believe if had I seen Jesus riding in on a donkey like that, I probably would have laughed. None of you guys would have laughed. But I would have been like, look at that guy. <laughs> right? But he didn't care. He was being obedient. And I'm sure because he's human and he's been around for 33 years, he knew what he looked like. I'm sure he knew what he looked like. Would you agree with me? I mean, he's probably seen some silly things in his life. And I'm sure he knew that he looked silly, but it didn't stop him. He still got on that little donkey and rode in. If one of the lessons we learned from this story is that if you want to serve God correctly and you want to be pleasing to God, it will take a humble service. Humility. Are you guys still with me? The other thing we learn from this portion of Scripture is that our identity, our internal identity, is more important than our outward image. Greatness does not come from the image you present to the world. Jesus wanted his disciples to know that greatness comes from who you are, not what you have. Stay with me. Greatness comes from the way you have ordered your inner man, not by how you clothe your outer man. Jesus gave his disciples the greatest lesson of all. It wasn't the greatest illustrated sermon of all, an illustrated sermon that they would never forget. Again, picture Mo and Byron and Big Frank riding in on three little tricycles with training wheels. You would never forget that. That was his, that was his intention. His last, one of his greatest and last messages was one of humility. It's what's happening on the inside that's more important than what you look like on the outside. So what? What kind of clothes you wear? If Michael Corr don't get saved, he's going to hell. Who's the other guys? Louis Vuitton. Kenneth Cole. They're all going to go to hell if they don't get saved. Doesn't matter what kind of cologne you wear. What kind of car you drive? Jesus drove a donkey. Are you guys still with me? Jesus gave his disciples the greatest lesson of all. It was his greatest illustrated sermon. Picture a 33-year-old man, Jesus, on a baby donkey, a coat. His feet are almost touching the ground. He is too tall. It look, it, he didn't look cool. When I was thinking about that, I was thinking about drip. You guys know, I barely found this out not too long ago. What a drip is? You guys know what a drip is? This is a drip right here. No, I just made it up. So I seen this guy. <laughs> I seen this guy get on uh, Instagram or something like that. I forget where I seen that. And he was he got on there and go, "How you like my drip?" Like that. And I'm like, "What is this dripping? What is he talking about?" But Jesus, I say that to say this. Jesus did not care about his drip. Jesus, the Bible says he had no place to lay his head. He had the, the donkey he was on, he borrowed it. Wasn't even his donkey. He wasn't concerned about uh, material wealth like some of us are. He could care less about it. 
Are you guys still with me? And yet, when he rode in on that donkey, people were praising him. They were taking off their garments and laying them in the road. They were shouting, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the king. The people didn't care if he looked crazy on a donkey. They knew who he was on the inside. They had experienced his love, his mercy, and great compassion. They had seen his miracles. Outward drippings didn't matter. It's not about the drip. So don't drip. It's not about the drip. It's about what's happening in here. What kind of heart do you have? How is your heart close to God? I was telling the guys the other day, when I first got saved, I got all my suits at the secondhand store. For years. I would say like for the first four or five years, all I did was went to, the, we used to call it the Mexican May Company. Today it might be called the Mexican Macy's. They don't have May Company no more, huh? They used to call it the Mexican May Company. When I was at the ranch, we had a, 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 a what do they call that, where you put all the clothes at in the home? Yeah, they had, they had the bless me's. But at the ranch, they called it J.C. Penney's. So when I first got there, <laughs> when I first got to the ranch, they said, hey, we're going to take you to J.C. Penney's tomorrow. I'm like, serious? Yeah, hey, I should have came here a long time ago. <laughs> And then they took me down to this basement. And there was all kinds of clothes there from all the old men who died. Because the ranch is right next door to a golf course. And every time those old guys would die, they would send all their clothes to the ranch. So we used to wear big old thick ties about this thick like that, going all the way down like that. Orange suits. We were dripping. And Matthew 21, 10 says, when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? People wanted to know who is this man, who even on a donkey's coat gets what kind of reception like that? It was Jesus, because it was not who he was on the outside, it was who he was on the inside. It was who he was. Is this the one who was going to deliver us from the Romans? Is this another prophet or a holy man? Is this the Messiah? Who is this? Now we know who he was. He was and is the king. In fact, he is the king of kings. The pre he is the king of kings that the prophet Zechariah prophesied in nine, chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt. This was 500 years before. This was written 500 years before Jesus rode on that donkey. What kind of king does that? Where are his armies? Where are his weaponries? Where are the flags and the standards and the symbols of power? Jesus needed none of that to show who he was. He knew who he was. Before Abraham was, I am. Me and my father are one. He knew who he was. When you know who you are, when you know you're a child of God, you're not intimidated by things like that. Those things, you don't, you don't grade yourself by what you wear. Somebody said it like this. He who is intimate with God will never be intimidated by man. When you have a relationship with God, a real relationship with God, it's almost like you can care less what people think about you. But on the flip side of that, you have to care what everybody thinks about you. And that's a whole different message. Talking about your testimony, where you're at, who you hang with. For the disciples of Jesus, this procession was an illustrated sermon. How would they live their lives? Not only that, but how will we choose to live our lives? What did disciples learn? What did the, 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 what did the disciples learn on Palm Sunday? It was who they are on the inside that mattered more than what they looked like. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider the appearance of his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearances, but the Lord looks at 
the heart. Let me ask you something. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are in the Lord? If we are children of God and servants of the kingdom, then when you walk into a boardroom, a courtroom, or any room, you are the salt and you are the light of the world. I was so, I, I'll never forget, I was here like maybe like three or four years, and I did a prayer there at the, at the, at the state uh, building. What's that called? The state building? The Capitol. Went to the Capitol in Nevada, and, and I found myself sitting next to the governor. Ooh. I'm sitting there next to the governor. I'm like, hey, you got a suit? I got a suit, too. They're like, I'm like, I'm, God's just reminding me, Pepe, I'm going to take you places. You just love me. It doesn't matter. It's not, and then again, it's not who you are on the outside. You're here because of who you are on the inside. You're my servant. Are you guys catching that? We're God's servants. We need to be God's servants. I'm getting ready to close right now. But when, so, then when, so then when you walk into a break room or a courtroom or any kind of room, you always have to remember that you are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. When you walk on a job and you've been praying, you carry with you the anointing of the Spirit of God. When you're at the family reunion, you're not just Uncle Mike or Uncle Mo. You're an ambassador for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You may say, I don't have a lot of money and I don't drive a great car. That's all right. The mission of heaven is driving you. Do we know who we are? If we lost our job and everything we own, will we still know who we are? And here's the last lesson, guys, that was learned that I want to share with you. I'm sure there were many others, but these are the three that I got. They learned that a servant lives and dies for other people. Jesus didn't need to be popular or well-liked. I'm asking musicians to make the way to the front. Jesus didn't need to be popular or well-liked or even loved by the crowd. The only thing that Jesus wanted to do was his Father's will. The only one he wanted to please was his father. John 6.38 says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus, the son, simply wanted to please the father and do his will. In the garden of Gethsemane, just a couple of days uh, after he rode into uh, Jerusalem, Jesus would be in deep prayer. And there was a, when you study the scriptures, there was a part of him that didn't want to go to the cross. But he knew that that was God's purpose for his life. He knew that he had come to die. Can I tell you something? You've come to die. Just a matter of who you're going to die for or what you're going to die for. I, I remember when, when I was probably in elementary, somebody said something that startled me. And they said, from the day you were born, you begin to die. And I'm like, what? Yeah, you're going to die. Do you know that the statistics on death are one out of every one person dies? You're going to die. The big question is this, how are you going to die and who are you going to die for? And what kind of legacy are you going to leave behind? Will you have succeeded in life the way God wanted you to? Would you have fulfilled God's purpose for your life? Can I tell you something? We were born to die for people just like Jesus. Not on a cross, not being whooped with a, a cat and nine tails, but we were called to die to self. To be willing to be humiliated for the gospel. I can't tell you how many times God has told me to, uh, to, to get on a train or stand on a table at a restaurant and just start preaching. And I'm like, I'm going to look stupid. And I'm sure to many people I did look stupid. But I did it because God told me to do it. I was, I'm called for that. When you study uh, uh, Paul's life, he says, you guys are rich and we are poor. You guys are considered the great people of the world. We are considered the offscouring, the, the, the scum of the world. But we do it because we love God and we love you. Are you willing to be the scum of the world? Ooh. Ooh, are you willing to be the scum? Hey, hey, Jeremiah. I'm glad you're here, Jeremiah. Are you willing to be the scum of the world, though? Because if we're going to serve the Lord, it might require that. 
It might require that we become nothing and nobody in the sight of men. Like we have nothing, like we are nothing. But are you willing to do that? Jesus was. He rode in on a donkey. He could have rode in with an army. But he wanted to fulfill scripture, so he rode in on a donkey. The apostle Paul says in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for other brothers and sisters. It's incredible to me how quick the popularity of Jesus faded. Where was the crowd that cheered him? Because now the crowd was chanting, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. When Jesus chose a donkey, he was at the height of his popularity, but less than a week later, no one stood up for him. Jesus was arrested. They placed a crown of thorns on his head. When he appeared before Pilate, he had already been beaten. Standing there as a prisoner under arrest, the crowd became disheartened. They were disappointed. They wanted a king that would fight for Rome. They wanted their miracle worker to save them. He no longer appeared as the one who would save them from the Romans. He appeared to be just a man. But Jesus was not just a man. He hung on the cross. And when he was hanging there, they were saying, you, you say you can save everybody, but you can't even save yourself. You've heard that before. If God is so great, then why didn't your son die? Why did your daughter die? Why, did you, why, why do you have cancer? Why are you struggling with this? Why is this happening in your life? The same thing they did to Jesus. And he still died on the cross. They came against him with everything they had. If your God is so real, then how do you explain this? Can't. I can't explain it. But I know God's real. How many thank God? Listen, how many thank God for the word, right? How many thank God for his faithfulness? God is faithful and God is real. And just because he doesn't come in on a stallion and save you doesn't mean he's not God. Maybe he wants to ride in on your situation on a donkey. Are you going to be okay with that? Because God is real. I may believe that. The Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But Jesus was not just a man. They told him, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. And they taunted him and said, he saved others, but he himself he cannot save. It was not that he couldn't have saved himself. It was that he would not save himself. The disciples all saw Jesus on that cross. They knew his suffering, his popularity was gone, but his purpose remained. How interesting, I wrote, that the lesson must have sunk into all of those disciples because each one said that they wouldn't leave him, and they did. However, when they return to the Lord, God used them in a powerful part. You might be here this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed. You may be here this morning, and you may have turned from God. You may have felt like you failed God. But can I tell you something? God is the God of the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, tenth, twentieth time. God is merciful. The Bible says, his mercies are new every morning, regardless of where you've come from, regardless. The Bible says this, <clears throat> the Bible, I, and, I, and I learned this scripture here. It really ministered to me here when I got here, <clears throat> that though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. Righteous people fall. Righteous people make mistakes. You can read all throughout the scriptures where men of God made mistakes made wrong moves, did wrong things. You know, King David, uh, he, was, he knew he wasn't supposed to count the people. He counted them, and thousands and thousands of people got killed by a plague because he made a wrong move. And yet, the Bible says he fulfilled his purpose on earth. And he was a man after God's own heart. Regardless of what you're coming from, what's happened in your life, can I tell you something this morning? God loves you. God loves you, and he has a plan for your life. I'm asking you to stand with me this morning. We got a few minutes. We're going to open the altar. If you want to come to the front, spend some time with the Lord. Just make your way to the front. We're going to spend some time with God. Amen. Hallelujah.
every eye closed. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus. Maybe this is your first time here. Maybe you're a backslider. Maybe you've been running from the Lord. Don't know how you got here this morning, but I know that God loves you and he has a plan for you. Maybe you feel like you failed God. Amen. What a powerful message that was. God's now, this love. word moved you and you want to come to Christ right now. Everything could change with this simple prayer. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask that you forgive me. Jesus, I believe that you are Lord. I want to be born again. Come inside my life, come into my heart, and help me live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said a prayer like that, we want to see you back here at Victory Outreach Reno. Don't be a stranger. God bless you.